Good morning and welcome to today's NCPDP webinar, Part 2, The Real-Time Prescription Benefit Transaction, Use Case Document, and Data Requirement Document Review. NCPDP is a not-for-profit ANSI accredited standards development organization with more than 1,500 members representing virtually every sector of the pharmacy services industry. NCPDP's vision is to lead the industry in healthcare standards and solutions for the common good. Our speaker today will be Laura Topper. President of Granada Health, Inc. For Q&A purposes, you can ask a question at any time during the webinar today by typing in the question pane on your GoToWebinar toolbar. All questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the webinar as time permits. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a PDF copy of the slides presented today and any necessary handouts for comments. I am now going to hand our presentation over to Laura. Laura? Thanks, Wendy. Um, not sure if your slides aren't moving. I'm still seeing the title page. There we go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, for those of you who were on Webinar 1, welcome back. For those of you who are new, welcome to Webinar 2. Um, over the next 90 minutes or so, I'm going to walk through some background on real-time prescription benefits, give some definitions, walk through the use case, and then we'll save time for questions and answers and then some next steps. If we go to the next slide, NCPDP formed our Real-Time Prescription Benefit Task Group in 2014. This came out of discussions with the industry and some um, CMS representatives and some initiatives there, acknowledging the need for an industry-wide standard solution for prescribers to have access to their patients' prescription benefit information in real time. As part of the EHR certification rulemaking process, the Office of the National Coordinator requested comments about this challenge facing the industry. So the task group was formed. We had identified a number of use cases associated with a prescription benefit inquiry. We have surveyed industry organizations to understand the priority of each use case. And what we have been tasked with and are responsible to deliver are those business requirements. So what are the use cases? What are the data elements? We are not at this point delivering a standard, although it is likely the next step in the process. Um, among the organizations surveyed included system vendors, prescribers, pharmacists, government representatives, and trade associations. In terms of process, we are taking all of the feedback that we are receiving from industry, those who are participating on the task group, and our members. Those will be presented and discussed at our November Joint Technical Work Group meeting. If everybody, all the members at the meeting agree, then a request will be reviewed that will allow us to begin work on the development of a standard to support real-time prescription benefit inquiry and response transactions. That request will also be reviewed by our board of trustees who will determine next steps. And so we will continue to follow all of our ANSI accredited procedures and the ultimate goal is publication of a standard with implementation guidance. So depending on what we hear from the industry and the meeting attendees, the timeline could be impacted. Um, and so that's what we're trying to work through. What I want to get through today is really, again, you know, the purpose of the webinars. The first webinar, we gave you some background and introduced the use case document. We're going to go into a lot more detail today. We are looking for a lot of input. We want to know if there are any gaps in the use cases, if the use cases are properly documented, and determine if the information returned by the processor slash PBM slash adjudicator, which could also be referred to as the payer or just the PBM, is complete. And so that's our goal with these webinars. 
So on the next slide, just to, again, set the stage, a real-time prescription benefit request and response transaction is a means to provide patient-specific prescription benefit information at the point of care. It is a request for that information that originates from the provider or the prescriber, and then a response from the processor or PBM. It is real-time. It is envisioned as real-time, and it is to facilitate provider and patient discussion and decisions on the most appropriate covered medication, pharmacy selection, and the estimated cost of therapy. One of the anticipated benefits is that this will reduce rejected claims at the point of dispensing, which should reduce pharmacy interactions with the PBM and the provider and the patient for benefit-related reasons. And so ultimately, we're thinking there's going to be improvement in medication adherence, patient satisfaction, prescriber satisfaction, among others. Um, Okay, so what is the use case document? It is our work product. It is designed to capture business requirements for an initial standard. And I'm going to emphasize initial. As many of you know, there's generally not just one version of a standard. But one is published, and that's where we start. And then based on industry need, enhancements and changes are made to the standard over time. So we're looking for something that's broad enough to be used as the initial standard get us out of the gate, and hopefully, I like to live by that 80-20 rule, so hopefully we'll, we'll meet it about 80% of the industry need initially. And the document describes the act of the provider requesting that and you know, submitting that inquiry, and then the process and scenarios under which a response is sent. On the next slide, if you have had a chance to look through the document, you've seen that there is global content. These are our assumptions, our scope, definitions, who are the actors or participants that are included. Our definitions are generally all existing NCPDP or industry definitions. We do have some elements and definitions that are new that we are proposing. And then within each use case, you will see descriptions, the data requirements for the request and the response, the process flows, and the pre and post conditions. On the next slide, I'll talk through a couple of the assumptions we've made. One is that the provider system allows the users to submit that request and receive that response. The response reflects the point in time the request was received and processed. And this is a key, key point. As we walk through this, you'll see, and as you read the document, you'll note that it's includes information based on that point in time. So if I'm in my doctor's office at 11 o'clock, and they run an inquiry, and they decide to send the prescription off to the pharmacy, and in the meantime, three other claims get processed, and I haven't met my deductible yet, it's entirely possible that my financial responsibility will vary by the time I get to the pharmacy to pick up that prescription because of other claims activities. Um, so we just want to emphasize that. It's it's as close as we can get to what we think it's going to be, but there are always going to be circumstances that could vary based on the time the request is processed and when the claim is processed. Um, we also took a look at multiple use cases applying to a single request. And so because there was the potential impact, negative impact to workflow for requiring multiple requests, we are looking at if there's multiple use cases for the request, the response would address all of those applicable scenarios. And the other overarching assumption that we made is that all use cases include an intermediary switch as an optional participant. It's not a requirement, but we have included that as optional in all of our use cases. If we move to the next slide, we'll talk about what's in scope and what's out of scope. So in scope, patient-specific drug benefit information, the information that's in the request, in the response, product alternatives, and that the communication is to be real time. What's out of scope for this initial standard is requests from anyone other than providers, the payer cost of the product, subscriber identification, 
coordination of benefits and requests for services, partial fills, or compounds. So let's move into some of the preconditions. So the preconditions are really our expectations of what the system is going to be able to do. These apply to all use cases and anything that's in italics is optional. So the, we're assuming the system is going to be able to capture and retain the data needed for the transactions, that the patient, their benefit information and the prescriber identification information are all available, that they have business rules established for formatting a request, as well as for receiving and presenting the response. On the next slide, we'll talk about the processor PBM preconditions, which is that they can interrogate the transaction data, that the patient is established as a benefit eligible member in their claims processing application, that the coverage information specific to that patient's pharmacy benefit is identified and that their business rules are established for formatting a response transaction. Okay, I've got a picture on the next slide. So if you're all looking at this going, oh my goodness, there's a lot of words on the slide. Um, we really wanted to just lay out the process flow, which is from the provider beginning to interact with their system to generate a request to what this EHR system does, <coughs> what the PBM system does, and then coming back to the provider. And again, I didn't include on here the optional intermediary and switch functionality, but those are available if users choose. And so if we go to the next slide, the picture might be a little bit easier for folks to take a look at. So again, in the process flow, the first thing is the provider is going to interact with their system. Their system is going to identify whatever that trigger is to format the request and send the request. If we go to the purple box, then the processor receives the request, processes it, formats the response, and sends the response back to the EMR system who receives it, and then presents it to the provider for them to review. Okay. On the next slide, just a couple of post conditions. Again, these um, exist for all use cases. So the expectation is the system will have initiated a request, the processor received it, processed it, formatted and delivered the response. The EMR system received that response and formatted it and presented it to the provider. And again, there's optional elements in here that address the role of the intermediary in the switch. If we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about data elements. What we are looking at, similar to pretty much every other NCPDP transaction, is that data elements or data segments are either required, situational, or optional. So if it's required, it has to go. For example, patient information is always sent. If it's situational, it's sent when certain conditions are met. So if the request is for a product that has a coverage limit, for example, a quantity restriction, then the response will indicate the allowed amount of that product. And then optional are fields or segments that are included at the sender's discretion. So perhaps the processor PBM wants to send back a free text message with additional information, and they'll be able to do that within the transaction. So if we move on to the request transactions, um, here's an overview of what they require. Um, transaction and routing information is always required. Um, patient information, what you see on the screen is required. Their name, their date of birth, a member identification number, and gender. Of the prescription or medication information, um, a product ID is needed. It could be... Um, Oh, I see a typo. I'm really sorry. That should be NDC, RX norm, or a UDI DI will need to be included, as well as the quantity and day supply. And in the provider section, the pharmacy needs to be identified either by NPI or NCPDP, as well as the provider or prescriber. And you could use their NPI or any of the other valid values. Um, a number of other elements are situational or optional. 
and you'll see that as you go through the document. Um, things like dispenses written, um, if the provider wants to indicate that either they or the patient is requesting, for example, a brand product, or residence information, um, which often comes into play with our long-term care patients. On the next, oh, you're already on the next slide. The response types, we've got, at this point, an affirmative response type, which is a transaction communicated to a provider for which coverage could be determined, or a negative response, which the transaction communicated to the provider in which any of the following occur. Um, the patient is not eligible, the product is not covered, um, or coverage and or provider restrictions exist. And both response types can include information such as alternative medications, coverage limits, and estimated financial responsibility. You will always have financial responsibility on an affirmative response. So if we move into the affirmative response, um, again, items that are italicized are optional or situational. So on, I'm going to send back the prescription information. I'm going to echo back the submitted medication. I may send back an alternate medication, and I will send back quantity and day supply. I will always send back on an affirmative response the estimated patient financial responsibility, but it will be up to that processor if they are going to include how that financial responsibility was calculated using all of the elements that you see, such as amount attributable to the deductible, the copay, product selection, um, coverage gap, processor fees. So those are all situational elements that could be returned. And again, transaction and routing information is always required. Um, what you'll also see on an affirmative response is we could send back information on coverage limits, um, particularly if we're dealing with a transition situation. So we'll cover as requested for this fill, but the plan may notify you that for a future fill, there's a coverage limit. Um, pharmacy information, again, is always is going to be um, optional or situational. So they're going to send back, um, Maybe there's a mail order benefit that's available to the patient as well. So that information would go back as alternate pharmacy. When we move to the negative responses, um, again, routing and transaction information goes. The denial explanation is required. The prescription information is required. Um, again, this could be a situation where they're going to say, the product isn't on formulary, and here are the alternatives that are available. Um, financial information, if the patient is not eligible, I'm not going to send financial information back. So you'll, you'll see as you go through the document that there's, in each use case, what's returned will vary. Um, also on negative responses, you'll see coverage limits again. So if I am sending back a negative response because of a coverage limit, I have to send the coverage limit information that's relevant. Um, same thing on a drug utilization evaluation. If I am returning a negative response because there's a, a DUE alert, I need to send back information so that the prescriber can take action. And again, you can see the type of information that would be included. So. We'll move on. Um, the other information, again, on negative response is pharmacy information. Um, you could have a situation where the patient um, requested pharmacy on that's submitted on the request is not available to fill for them. It could be um, because they are locked into a certain pharmacy by the plan, or the plan, um, based on the product, will say that the patient needs to go to a specialty pharmacy. So if that use case is what's in play, then pharmacy information will be returned. Um, similarly, if there's a situation where the patient is locked in or restricted to a certain prescriber, and the submitted prescriber is not that prescriber, we'll send back that lock-in information to say, 
you know, unfortunately this patient needs to see this prescriber for this medication or this class of medication. So on the next slide, you'll see the 12 use cases that we have established. Um, the six that are in bold are the ones that I'm going to walk through in detail, and then the other six I will speak to at a higher level. Um, and again, this is based on all of the industry input and the 100 plus task group calls that we have had over the past couple of years. So use case one is what we like to refer to on the next page is, um, I call, we call this the happy path. Patient's eligible, the product is covered. So Mary sees Dr. Jones, who determines she needs a beta blocker. Dr. Jones says, okay, we're going to go with systolic. It's going to be one a day, so that's a quantity of 30. They decide on Elm Street Pharmacy, and they submit the request. And the response comes back that, yep, systolic is covered, and it's $20 for that 30-day supply at Elm Street Pharmacy. So on the next slide, you'll see a graphical representation of this. So again, that, that flow of the provider interacting with their system, submitting the request through, in this case, that intermediary switch onto the processor, and then the affirmative response coming back. And financial responsibility is denoted in bold because that's required to be returned on that affirmative response. So we'll move on to use case number three, which is a benefit exclusion. John sees Dr. Nelson and asks about medication for his erectile dysfunction. Dr. Nelson submits a benefit request for sildenafil, and John's plan responds that this is excluded from coverage under his plan, and so John needs to decide if he's going to pay cash for this. And so when we looked at benefit exclusion, the task group agreed that this is a situation where it's not covered. Everything is excluded from coverage. There is really no exception process. Um, if anybody's ever read their certificate of coverage, there's always that section at the back of services not covered, investigational, um, certain classes. So that's what we addressed here. And again, you can see the graphical representation of this. And again, the only message that's going to go back is that this is not covered for the patient. No financial information will be returned because it is simply not covered. Use case four is our formulary exclusion use case. So this is a little different. Um, so Bob goes to Dr. Maple. Dr. Maple says, time to start your statin treatment. Let's submit a request for less call for a 30-day supply at Big Box Pharmacy. So the plan responds that less call isn't on formulary, but atorvastatin, fluvastatin, and lovastatin are all preferred formulary products. Bob will pay $10 for a 30-day supply of either of those products at Big Box Pharmacy, or he could pay $20 for a 90-day supply either at Big Box or through the mail order pharmacy. So again, we've got the picture and the response. The formulary exclusion message is required. The financial responsibility is required. The alternative information and the pharmacy information are optional, but in this use case, they would be returned. Use case seven, PA required. So Susan sees the neurologist, Dr. Davis. Her MS symptoms are getting worse. So they decide together that it's time to start treatment, and Dr. Davis submits a request for Avonex to her plan. The plan responds with a message that prior authorization is needed, and that if approved, Susan would pay $75 for each 30-day supply. Uh, a case like this, depending on the product, could also include information about a restricted pharmacy, if it were a specialty product or a limited distribution drug. So when we look at the picture, the prior authorization is required, and the financial information is returned, assuming that the prior authorization is approved. And then we go to use case nine, out-of-network provider. So Deb's traveling. She falls ill. She sees Dr. White at a local clinic, and he determines that um, Odansetron is needed. and 
submits a benefit request to Deb's health plan. And the plan responds with a message that Dr. White's not in their provider network, and any prescriptions written by Dr. White are not covered. And in this case, because Deb's on the road and she's feeling miserable, she's going to choose to pay cash for that medication. So in the graphical representation, again, the flow is identical. The information that's returned simply is that this is an out-of-network provider. And so no other information is returned, no financial information, no alternatives. It simply stops there. And then use case 12 is our restricted pharmacy use case. So Mike sees Dr. Stevens, who determines that Mike needs to start a new medication for his hep C. And he usually gets his medication filled at Main Street Pharmacy. So Dr. Stevens submits a benefit request for Harvoni to be filled at Main Street Pharmacy. And the plan responds with a message that says, Harvoni must be filled at very special pharmacy. And Mike will pay $200 for a 30-day supply. So this is one example of restricted pharmacy. Um, again, if the patient is locked into a specific pharmacy or must use mail order. So those are our three situations for restricted pharmacy. Um, as an example, maybe Mike, instead of this, is locked into one pharmacy for all of his narcotic prescriptions. So just to give you a sense of that, and again, you see on the response, that it's restricted pharmacy is the message that will go back. The pharmacy information is required, as well as the financial responsibility. And then to briefly introduce the other use cases, um, use case two is the patient is not eligible. So on the day the request was received or processed, the patient is not eligible for benefits. So that's the message that would go back. Use case five is coverage limits. And there could be a limit on either the quantity or day supply allowed, or that the patient's age and or gender may not be clinically appropriate for the medication. Um, coverage limits can be included on either an affirmative or negative response. Um, use case six is step therapy. Um, so in this situation, the plan would require that other medications be tried before the requested medication is approved for coverage. So the message that would go back is that step therapy is required, and then the available medications or the required suggested medications that the plan has identified would be included on the response. Use case eight is out-of-network pharmacy, um, very similar to out-of-network provider, which is that the requested pharmacy is not in the network, and the patient will have to pay cash if they choose to use that pharmacy. Use case 10 is patient provider lock-in. So this is the situation where the patient is restricted to a certain provider, or perhaps a group of providers, and the plan will not pay for prescriptions written by the requesting provider. And so the response would indicate that the requesting provider is not authorized for that patient, and then provide information as to who is authorized to write for that patient. And then the last use case is our drug utilization evaluation alert. So the plan has information about something that the patient appears to be currently taking. And the utilization alert that is occurring is severe enough that a claim for the requested product would be rejected at the pharmacy. So you would see this um, for <laughs> likely duplication, therapeutic duplications, or drug-drug interactions. And the information back to the prescriber, again, would be sufficient for them to take action, whether that's contacting the other provider or discontinuing an existing medication. But we have to give them enough that they can take action. So those are some of our use cases. Um, what we'd really like is for folks over the next few days to very closely review that use case document. Um, if you were on webinar one, you received it last week. If you joined us just today for webinar two, it was mailed out before the webinar. And it's also available in the handouts pane of the GoToWebinar session. Um, please let us know if we missed a scenario. Um, if there is something that you feel is not properly documented with the situations. And if 
we have sufficient data for each use case request and response to properly determine the patient benefit and estimated cost. Um, we are looking for all comments to be returned to Sue via the Sue Thompson at NCPDP using the comment form by October 18th, which is coming up very quickly. Um, if you are available to join us in Atlanta on November 3rd at 5 o'clock, please do so. That is when all additional comments will be reviewed. Um, the work group will determine if the use case document is sufficient and can move forward, as well as they will review the request to begin work on a standard. So just sometimes pictures are easier, so we need all the input by the 18th. Um, all of the materials for the work group will be posted prior to that, so all members can download that information and continue to review that. Um, on November 3rd, the members will either approve, pend, or deny the use case document as it's presented. Once the use case document is approved, um, then we'll, as I talked about, we'll have that project development form, which is the request to begin work on a standard. And then once that's approved and goes through the board, um, then we will begin standard development work. So with that. OK, thank you, Laura. We will now start the Q&A portion of our webinar. Remember, you can ask a question by typing in the question pane on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Our first question today, what if a patient is in a long-term care facility or assisted living that uses specialized packaging with interconnectivity to electronic administration systems? Additional, the nursing facility may have formularies. If a response is sent back to the prescriber that suggests an alternative pharmacy, this would create disruption to the integrity of the medication management systems in place. Multiple pharmacy providers or retail pharmacies in a nursing facility place the facility and patients at risk. I see no use cases for patients residing in a nursing facility. Good question. Um, so thank you. We do have the ability on a request for the prescriber to indicate patient residence. It is not a required element. Um, so in that situation, um, that information would flow to the processor. Um, I, we've struggled with this a little bit because Oftentimes, it is the facility that determines what pharmacy is used, not necessarily the plan. Um, so I would encourage um, whoever submitted that to submit that as a comment for the entire task group to review to see if um, that's any sort of use case that we can look to add or modify an existing use case to support that business need. Okay, thank you, Laura. Our next question. For a rejection where the pharmacy is not covered, the return response will have a list of covered pharmacies. Will that include all covered pharmacies within a certain area, like mileage range? So there are two use cases that address pharmacy. One is if the pharmacy is out of network. And so if the pharmacy is not in the plan's network, that is the message that will be returned. Um, we will not be supporting sending in-network pharmacies and trying to identify those. We'll simply say the submitted pharmacy is not in network for this patient. Um, if it's a situation that falls into use case 12, where the pharmacy that is submitted is not eligible to dispense that product for that patient, either because the patient is locked into a specific pharmacy, there's a specialty pharmacy provider that must be used for that product, or the patient has a mandatory mail order benefit. 
in those cases, the allowable pharmacy or pharmacies up to five will be included on the response. Okay, thank you, Laura. Our next question. Can we get patient prescription COPA and formulary coverage information by running D1 transactions in real time? Roger, I'm actually going to let you speak to that because I believe that's a telecom <coughs> transaction. Yeah, so a D1 is a predetermination of benefits transaction, and it is part of the telecom standard, and I might have to have you repeat the beginning of that question, but there are some people using that to establish the patient's financial responsibility. And I, what was the other part of the question? I think formulary. Um, the question was, can we get patient prescription copay and formulary coverage information? And yes, people are using it for both, formulary and copay. Okay, thank you, Roger. Is it required to tell the provider which pharmacy the member is locked into? As we have currently written it, yes, if the patient is locked into a pharmacy that information needs to be returned to the prescriber so they know where to send the prescription. Okay, thank you, Laura. Our next question, shouldn't quantity and day's supply be required on the request? Isn't the prescriber going to know these items? Uh, I believe that they are required on the request. Um, let me just Yep, quantity and day supply are required on the request. Thank you, Laura. Um, let's see, our next question coming off of can we get prescription copay and formulary coverage information by running D1 transaction in real time. If this is true, then how widely, how widely is D1 used by PBM? So this is Roger Pinsno again. So it's it's been a transaction that's existed within the telecom standard for quite a few years. Don't quote me on the number. I'm thinking since 2007, but not widely adopted. It is being used right now, though, by prescribers within their EHR and we had a presentation from a from a organization that is currently supporting that. Okay, thank you, Roger. Our next question, will this function be integrated with the current electronic prescribing that is currently in use? I think the operating assumption that we have is that from a workflow perspective, yes, um, EMR and e-prescribing vendors would integrate this into their e-prescribing workflow. Um, what we are building is, is the mechanism to exchange the information, but not determining how it should be used by any system vendor. But the logical assumption is it would be part of the e-prescribing workflow. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, we have no further questions at this time. So um, at, with that, we're going to conclude today's NCPDP webinar, part two of the real-time prescription benefit transaction, use take use case document and data requirement document review. You will receive a follow-up email shortly with a PDF of the slides, a link to a recording of today's webinar, and any additional handouts um, Laura mentioned within the webinar.
Please join us for the November work groups in Atlanta and come a day early to enjoy the November 1st Educational Summit, Connecting Data for Connected Care with ONC opening keynote, Dr. Vindal Washington. Thank you, Laura and Roger, for the time and expertise you shared with us today. And thank you all for your participation. Have a great day. Thanks, Wendy.